I consent to being recorded. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome. My name is Aaron Smith. I'm the CEO of EBA and Team Zero, and we're really pleased today to be joined by our collaboration partner, Better Built Northwest, and their technical advisor and industry liaison and frequent speaker uh, at EBA and all around building science guru, Dan Wildenhaus. Dan will be presenting today uh, options for adva advanced walls in the EBA Team Zero webinar and post podcast series. Uh, we're also joined by Nancy Bakeman. Nancy, always great to see you. And uh, as always, we have the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. Enter your questions there. We'll try to get to those uh, throughout today's presentation. So with that, Dan, I'd love to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Aaron and Nancy. It's great to be with everyone again, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk about options for advanced walls. Now, of course, when I say this, there are so many different strategies we can use for our envelopes, right? I, everything from, you know, someone says, are, are you going to talk about hay bales? And how about hobbit houses beneath the ground? Um, so pardon my yeah, I thought, sure I for thought thought for sure you were going to talk about hobbit houses. Today. <laughs> <laughs> well, pardon the pun, but we're going to stick with stick built um, designs for today. Got it. Um, for the most part, because this is what is eminently considered buildable by most builders that we're talking to. Yeah. Um, so I, I will show off a couple of other things along the way as we go. And there are a lot of links in today's presentation. So. We, there will be a PDF of this that's available and that will have all the links to be live. So if there's something that you say, I really wanna know more about that, Dan, um, then you'll have, again, lots and lots of links um, to, to continue to educate yourself on. Yeah, and, um, uh, and just a quick housekeeping, Nancy, we'll post that PDF up. Do you want to uh, chat instructions and where people can go to see that PDF at the end? Yes, I will do that. Awesome, thank you so much. And I will also give my email address at the end, which is also going to be in the PDF. So you can reach out to me directly if you have some specific questions as we go through. Um, so short intro, uh, my name is Dan. I've been, I've been doing this for about 25 years. The, the first 15 years of my career, I was actually a contractor. So I was out there. I mean, we were experimenting with wet spray cellulose and I was fixing crossover ducts under mobile homes. And I was a home energy raider, just about anything you can think of energy efficiency related to residential, multifamily or small business, new or existing. Um, I had some experience with it. In the last 10 years, I've really been focused more on the consulting side. And I've been working with Better Built Northwest, which is a program from NIA, the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. And unlike most programs, we don't provide a certification um, we don't even directly provide incentives. Instead, we're really a support mechanism for encouraging builders to build above code in the Pacific Northwest. This said, we also have partnerships with groups like EBA and Team Zero, um, as well as many others across the country. So a lot of the work I do pops up also in Minnesota or New York or Arizona or Tennessee. Um, so we really do kind of try to touch around the country. Um, so this is a little bit about me and a little bit about Better Built Northwest. You can see some of the things that we do um, on the right. Uh, we've got a really detailed website, which trust me, there's gonna be lots of links to see that as we go. I, this is a, I used this joke in the last one where we talked about building tight and ventilating right. Um, it sometimes feels like the way codes are pushing us and above code programs, like you know, you need to be a rocket surgeon to figure this stuff out. And our hope today is to bring it back from that a little bit so you can see you don't have to be a rocket surgeon to at least um, get an introduction to some of these things. So what, what do we mean by advanced walls? Well, you know, on the one hand, we're talking about things like the R and U value, right? So there's the prescriptive lev levels in codes. And then in the IECC, the 2021 IECC, as well as several state codes, there's a suite of additional measures. And don't worry, I'll, I'll show you those specifically. So one definition of an advanced wall is an improved, um, you know, either UA overall for heat loss and heat gain or improved average R value over what is dictated by code. Another way to describe it is to think about the thermal bridging, right? We can say, we can look at things like framing fractions, what actually connects 
from the interior to the exterior? And what percentage of the framing has a direct pass-through? Um, that is going to be a thermal bridge. And then there are things like woofy analysis that can be done, where we're actually looking at how heat and moisture uh, translate through building structures. I will state, you'll see a, a little bit of woofy in here, but I am not a woofy expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, that's its own unique specialty, but we are gonna look at that a little bit. So I'm gonna give you a couple of quick things that I use to define um, advanced walls. At least 8% better UA than the 2018 IECC or your local code. That's kind of a minimum threshold. 15% less thermal bridging would be a really nice detail and 20% lower U value in your windows. Believe it or not, we are gonna consider windows part of walls. Just as a quick reference, if you looked at advanced framing 24 on center versus 16 on center for say a 32 foot long wall, it's approximately a 30% reduction in thermal bridging um, with the advanced framing just by removing all of those um, additional sticks. Now, of course, if you have 13 king studs next to a window, that, that all goes out, out, out the window, literally. Um, but that's gonna be what, what I'm kind of using today to describe. There's another component to this. We want to prevent um, certain types of problems with our walls. So building something that is more thermally resistive, but does not take care of moisture migration, probably is not a good long-term answer. So when we have a house with warm, moist air in it, we know that you know, heat flows from what? From hot to cold and moisture goes from what? From wetter to drier. There can be a natural progression in a lot of part of the country of warm, moist air migrating its way through our walls towards the exterior. And that can be both through vapor transmission um, you know, or, direct, or directly through air movement. And what happens when warm, moist air from a house goes through a wall and achieves a dew point and then hits a condensing surface. Well, you can wind up with mold, you can wind up with mildew, and maybe worst of all, you could wind up with lawyers being involved. So we wanna consider this as a component of what we're talking about. It will not be the primary driver for today, but I do think it's worth us thinking about. Now, there are a lot of different climate zones and climate zone maps out there. These are two of the most you know, popularly used. On the left side, you see the IECC climate zones. On the right, you see Building Science Corporation's hydrothermal regions. For today, um, just again, this is a lot based on my experience, but this is kind of the most average. We're gonna talk about climate zones four, five, and six or marine, cold, and mixed humid primarily. So that's where I'm gonna use the examples for. It doesn't mean that these walls cannot work in other climates as well. So let's start, if we're talking about better than the code, what is the code? Um, so here's the 2018 IECC um, with a nice hatchet job by myself. So in these four, five, and even six, you know, what we're really looking at four and five is an R20 wall um, or R13 plus R5 continuous or a framed wall U factor of 0 0.060. So we can start thinking about being better than this. So something like a, um, you know, 0 0.055, 0 0.055, 0 0.054 might be 8% better than that. Um, what is changing though? What does the new code look like? Well, in 2021, the IECC for those same climates, the base case for a wood frame R value wall is 20 in the cavity and five continuous or 13 in the cavity and 10 continuous or 15 outboard entirely. And that's equivalent to a U factor of about 0 0.045. So start thinking about getting 8% better than that. Um, so we're now talking about, you know, down of, can we get to 0 0.043 or 0 0.040? Can we get down in that range? Um, that is going to be an advanced wall when we look at the 2021 IECC. Now, if you didn't know, and by the way, I don't expect you to actually read this. I'm just, this slide is just to point out that it exists. 2021 actually has added um, so what they call additional efficiency packages. Now these are gonna be up for voluntary adoption or uh, by each state. Uh, I suspect many states will amend this out, but this is um, a lot of development that came from Washington state and the state of Oregon. 
um, those two codes have been uh, utilizing additional efficiency packages for several code cycles. And it's kind of a two-way street, you know, our local codes learn from the IECC and the IECC learns from advanced local codes. So this is actually something that is not uncommon in, in my neck of the woods, but might be for others. So let's take a look at it where you can actually see it a little bit more clearly. There are a total of five potential additional efficiency packages, an enhanced thermal envelope, um, more efficient HVAC, reduced energy use and water heating, more efficient duct distribution and improved air sealing and efficient ventilation systems. What are they looking at in their definition of an enhanced envelope performance is the total building thermal envelope UA should be less than 95% of the total UA from the prescriptive. So this is a 5% gain would be in their sense, 5% um, over the 2021. That's even more than 8% over the 2018. So just even in code, you can see that we're already pushing down this road of really looking to say, can we really improve the U value or the R vector of our wall systems? And again, I look at that by adding in, can we reduce the thermal bridging and can we protect from moisture damage um, in these walls? Um, there are, as I said earlier, a ton of different types of advanced walls out there, right? There's structurally insulated panels, insulated concrete forms. Um, if you're not familiar with this one in the upper right, um, that's a company out of Canada called Just Biofiber and they're hempcrete blocks. Um, pretty cool. Um, they have not posted the actual R value of this yet, but I've asked for their technical spec sheet um, to see if they can get it. They just stayed on their website. It's better than R20. <laughs> um, but these are some options that we're not really gonna talk about today. But again, there's a lot, there's so much out there. All of it is highly valuable. We're really gonna try and stick to stick frame today. Mm -hmm. So with our framing and wall designs, you know, what are our things we really wanna think about? So thermally improved walls are one measure that's been traditionally pushed forward with our energy codes. That said, there's still a great many opportunities to reduce our heat loss or gain in order to lower our overall energy use prior to considering things like adding generation. Some of what we'll talk about over the next, you know, rest of the 55 minutes here um, will reflect both how we frame out our structures and how we insulate them. Um, and we're going to talk about both the interior and exterior of our buildings as we talk this through. So a quick big picture of what it is we're going to talk about today. So these are the three major wall types and I'll give you a really good reason why in a couple of slides, these are the three. And I'm gonna give you some links to some really good resources to learn a lot more. Um, so the first is the thermal break shear wall. Um, in the Northwest, it's actually referred to as the Martha wall um, because a builder Martha Rose started doing this about 20 years ago. Um, there are other national variations of this. You may have heard of zip walls. Zip, the zip wall system is a type of thermal break shear wall. The extended plate and beam wall developed by Home Innovation Research Labs or at least promoted by them. Um, Thermoply OXIS, I believe it's called. They've got a version of this. So the real key here is the insulation, continuous insulation is between your exterior sheathing and your studs. The next is we could talk about intermediate framed walls with exterior rigid insulation, or we could talk about double walls. And they could be two by four double walls, two by six double walls, or they could be staggered stud walls, which is what you see in that picture um, down below. So that's a single sill plate where you stagger um, your interior and your out exterior studs. So there's, again, very little thermal bridging. So with each of these, we're looking at increased thermal performance, reduce thermal bridging, and we want to apply which ones make sense in which climate zones, again, for that moisture protection as we go through. Um, before I go any further, I just want to check and see if any of the chat um, questions have come in or anything that we need to, looks like so far it's just um, Nancy sharing where you'll be able to see these slides. But again, please don't hesitate to um, add your questions and I will be pausing um, to check as we go through. So when we look at just the prescriptive components of code, you know, the two wall types that might be an immediate upgrade from what a builder is doing today 
that could satisfy the prescriptive ones. It would be the thermal break shear wall and the intermediate frame with exterior insulation. Um, so we think about this again, these are ways to get that 8% reduced UA, still hey, Dan, produce, yeah. Just a quick, uh, we always get the acronym question. What does PNB stand for again? Ah, plate and beam. And again, there will be a, so the, what's called the extended plate and beam and have no fear, I will be showing this, uh, some good images of this in just a couple minutes. Great, thanks Dan. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's exactly the kind of stuff that's worth interrupting me for is if I use an acronym or some jargon or lingo that just isn't resonating, please ask. Um, if you wanna talk about um, the 2021 level with the additional measures, or you're looking at above code programs, maybe you're participating in Earthcraft or National Green Building Standard or DOE Zero Energy Ready Home or any other number of um, national programs, then moving to things like double stud walls can make a lot of sense. Um, I will talk a little bit later about there's a little bit of caution when you put that much insulation between the interior and the exterior and you don't keep the exterior sheathing warm. Um, and I saw that George Songus is on today, so I'm sure he's going to uh, either correct me or ask some pointed questions if I don't get that just right. Um, but a double stud wall really is a, is a pretty, can be a pretty decent solution in the right climate and environment for the really more advanced stick framed wall. So why did I pick some of these? Well, these are some really great places if you really want to dive in deeper. Um, NIA, the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, the same group that um, funds Better Built Northwest, did um, two phases of reports looking at these three wall types um, and looking at everything from what's the hydrothermal performance of the wall, what's the um, energy performance of the wall. What are considerations with energy code? Um, what are keys for the trades and training? What are some approximate costs, both at startup and at scale? And what are some benefits that go with each of these wall types? Um, so they're really, really terrific reports. There's a, just so much in there that we could spend an hour and a half on each one of them. And then the DOE and Home Innovation Research Labs, they have several reports out there. This is the one that I think is the, maybe the best to start with and get the, the information you really need is the extended plate and beam report. Um, it's effectively a variation on what we call the thermal break shear wall or the Martha wall. So with that, let's just jump right in and talk about the thermal break shear wall. So here we've got several different ways to look at this, right? So again, we call this the Martha wall up in Seattle. Um, I'm actually gonna turn off my camera just so that I don't lose any bandwidth here. Um, so there's approach in other parts of the country often refer to this as the extended plate and beam, which we'll talk about in, in the next slide. And again, like I said, there are some proprietary systems out there like the zip wall system and the thermal apply OXIS. Um, I call those over the counter solutions that are available in the marketplace. As you can see, we get some benefit, obviously, from having continuous insulation, uh, you know, right? That's obviously going to enhance our wall. Um, another major factor is that you have got an exterior surface for nailing and penetration ceiling and mounting of windows that trades are much more familiar with um, when compared to exposed foam or mineral wool board. So in the Northwest, one of the things that happened here is we moved to two by six walls um, a lot earlier than a lot of the rest of the country did. Um, so that was a way to kind of increase our thermal resistance, but without having to go to exterior insulation. And because of that, we're, we're in this position where builders that build with exterior insulation in a lot of parts of the country somehow all of a sudden forget how to do that when they get to the Northwest. And they have all these complaints about, oh, my window guys hate this, or the, the siding gal really has a, a tough time with this. Well, when you look at something like the thermal break shear wall, by having your board onto the outside of your insulation, most of those types of complaints go away. Yes, there are still some, and I'll cover those in just a minute. And you do need to do some enhanced nailing with these, but, this type of structure really can eliminate some of those questions. Now, there are some potential challenges with code acceptance. Um, just because it's not lit, this does not literally line up with the way that a lot of um, state or local codes may evaluate that. 
But there's some good news. We actually have some case studies and I'll show you where to go to get them um, that we can share that documented how this approach was approved in certain jurisdictions. Um, and we've actually used some of those case studies to get other jurisdictions to approve this wall type. The right foam does need to be selected um, or the right rigid product because you have to think about vapor transmission, right? So EPS foam and uh, GPS foam is different than XPS and both are very different from mineral wool. So moisture movement is, is certainly a consideration as well as is cost and product availability. And the next thing we look at is cost. So there's some added incremental costs obviously over not having any insulation. And when we look at it up first, it's somewhere around $1.40 a square foot for an additional cost as we go through this. But the economics of scale and talking to some builders who've been doing this show that we might be able to get this incremental cost down to 48 cents a square foot um, once it's been scaled up. So one reason the cost is gonna show up lower here than on continuous insulation, again, is the fact that um, it's a pretty easy wall to put together. And again, we don't have that inherent challenge from window siding penetration people that we associate with continuous insulation. On a comparative scale, this wall type is relatively easy to install. It reduces the thermal bridging, structurally stronger actually than a typical wall, and may reduce sound transmission, but it does need to be installed correctly to protect against moisture issues. The extended plate and beam, this is the, that version that we talked about here. Um, with this version, the top and bottom wall plates are extended out by using a different dimension on them than you use on your studs. Um, this makes integrating your siding details at the tops and the bottoms of the wall potentially easier than with a regular thermal break shear wall. And it gives you a nice nailing surface at the top and the bottom of the wall for your sheathing in general. So it's really just a variation. Otherwise, it's basically the same wall. Now, there are some special considerations here. Um, door jams and thresholds and window returns and sills are all going to need to be a little deeper because you've added some foam. Um, you want to stagger the sheets. So you want to not have the seam for your rigid product line up with the seam for your sheathing. So that can be done by literally just stagging at one stud over. And then finally, and maybe most important, if we look here um, on a traditional wall, um, if you can see the flat plate that's been nailed crossing from the top floor to the bottom floor across the rim, um, that flat piece is a traditional way to do this. Well, that's kind of hard to do um, when you're doing a thermal break shear wall. So instead, we use this, um, this other tie, right, where it actually goes to the side of the studs and goes down and this connects our walls. So this, it's called a strap approach. And that strap approach works really well with extended plate and beam and, and thermal break shear walls. So definitely a structural consideration. How does this perform? Well, if you remember um, points 060 and point 045 were kind of our targets, if you will, for um, the, the overall U factor. Um, this wall is about a 0 0.043, depending on how good your math is and, and some things like um, your framing factor, right? What percentage of your wall is made up by framers and headers? Um, that will affect this. But and Dan, this wall, yeah. And this is for the post and beam, the 0 0.043? Uh, yeah, for the extended plate and beam or the thermal break shear wall. Okay. Yep. Great. Um, and this is a, yep, this is assuming intermediate framing. So intermediate framing is still 16 on center. It just means that you make room and you, all your corners, intersections and headers for insulation. Right. Um, so as you can see the header here, path C has room um, for insulation. Again, I brought up that there are code challenges. So this is a place, uh, a website called buildinginnovations.org. Um, and you go there and you can click on the case studies and look under building envelopes. And there's a couple of them. There's the Martha wall up in Seattle and the thermal break shear wall down in Oregon. Um, both are great case studies that show how this was um, pushed through with local code jurisdictions. And again, we've been successful at using these case studies in other code jurisdictions. Um, and it's a pretty nice thing to have to be able to say, we understand this might not align perfectly. Here's all other jurisdictions have adopted this. So the next thing you could do is say, well, 
what about kind of the traditional way? I, I call this the old school Energy Star approach. Um, I first started seeing this in Energy Star homes across the country, oh gosh, 12 years ago, maybe, maybe even a little bit before that. So here we have the exterior rigid insulation. And obviously, again, we get benefit from continuous insulation. Um, with this approach, however, you know, our siders, window installers, and trim folks will need some proper training and might even need some different flashing and sealing materials to get this well right. Um, so selecting the correct rigid insulation product to ensure that a moisture issue doesn't develop is important, as well as integrating this product into the rest of the wall considerations are still critical decisions. You may need to provide additional training for your siding and your trades that are going to work on the exterior. Um, the reports that I had referenced earlier and tools such as Construction Instruction, um, their app, have really great details on integrating weather barrier materials with exterior foam. So if you have a concern about some of this, I can't stress strongly enough how awesome the construction instruction app is. Um, it's got tons of animations, videos, and images to help you think through things like, how do I um, integrate my window in, or how do I integrate my weather resistive barrier um, with something like exterior foam? On incremental cost, Right now, the first time you do it, it's probably some, anywhere between $2.50 to $4.50 additional a square foot, depending on a couple of things. You know, are you doing one or two layers of foam? How thick is the foam you're putting in? Um, but if we built this enough on scale, again, those economies of scale, we're seeing that the cost could go down to as low as like $1.03 up to $2.34 a square foot. Again, on a comparative scale, this wall type does reduce that thermal bridging, may reduce sound transmissions, and usually improves our moisture risks, again, if everything's done correctly. But training of the key trades will likely be mandatory here. Um, also, if you are in a place where you're looking at things like carbon scores um, for both this wall and the previous walls, um, you might wanna think about what type of foam you're using. There are different brands and types that have lower global warming potential than others. Um, so lower or better carbon scoring. So if that is a consideration for you, um, definitely think through which products you want to use. Dan, just for the audience, what would be, you know, if, if you are in a lo location or jurisdiction that has a carbon score mm -hmm. or is looking at you carbon footprinting, which would be the best selection to potentially make? Probably rigid mineral wool um, if it's cost competitive in your area and available. If not, um, I'm, a, I'm starting to really like the new GPS foam um, that's mm -hmm. hit the market. <clears throat> that has a much low, lower global warming potential. Right. But we've also started to see that some of the major blue board, pink board brands uh, are coming out with better blowing agents. Yeah. And so they're reducing their carbon footprint or their global warming potential as well. But right now out the gate from the foams, the GPS seems to be the lowest carbon scoring or with the uh, lowest global warming potential of these outside of rigid mineral wool. I really like the rigid mineral wool because it effectively works as an extra drainage plane on top of everything else. Um, it really allows uh, drying um, both through vapor transmission and bulk water pretty well. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. When you do um, exterior rigid insulation, you know the biggest consideration and complaint we get is you know, tying in my window. Uh, so there are a couple of different approaches that seem to be gaining popularity. Um, on the lower left here, you see that kind of bluish green um, wood there. Um, we refer to those kind of as window boxes, right? So there are additional trim pieces. It's just painted OSB usually or plywood. Um, and it's built in so that you can imagine right there how much foam you could put on um, and still have it align with a nailing surface for a window. Another product, which is on the right side, the lower right and kind of exploded view of the upper right, is a product called Thermal Buck. And this is an insulated material that has some structural stability to it already. And it really helps this kind of integration of putting windows in with something like um, continuous exterior insulation. So really pretty cool product. It may have its limitations in how thick of um, continuous insulation you can use and still have a thermal buck be the answer. Um, but certainly it works up to two inches mm -hmm. of continuous insulation. It may work for even more. When we, yep, did you have a question, Aaron? No, I, well, 
are you bucking all all three sides just like you're boxing out with the plywood yep. there? yeah that is correct yep you would so go we'll all the way around out. the window yep and then technically not shown but you would have your um your drainage wrap your window wrap between and underneath and over that right that is correct. Um, and, and yeah, so that, you know, this is where we've got a limitation in how much I can cover in an hour, but yeah, right. um, yeah, your, your time, you know, the start with the rule of thumb that John Tooley always promoted, which is never tuck your, <laughs> yeah, never tuck your raincoat into your underwear. Um, right. So <laughs> think great. about lapping your materials correctly. Right. If you want more information, maybe my new favorite thing in the universe is building science fight club. Um, you can either sign up for their newsletter or yeah. follow um, Christine on Instagram. Yeah, just, just awesome and just yeah. great details. I, I, I can't say speak highly enough of that. Totally agree. And I think you got great advice. You know, if you don't have the construction instruction app, they'll show a lot of that correct window wrap detail. Yep. And I agree wholeheartedly. Christine and the job she does yep. with uh, Building Science Fight Club. You know, the first rule, don't talk about Fight Club, right? <laughs> She's probably Although, cool. yeah, what I love about Christine as well is uh, her general rule of thumb is you can use my images, just don't make either of us look stupid, um, which I've always appreciated that. Yeah, absolutely. And we are getting a, I see a question popping in from yeah. uh, my buddy, Robert. Um, what about Gutex? There, there are, you know, Robert, there are a, a million, not a million, there are at least a dozen other products I'm not mentioning today that um, are also really decent solutions. So that's G-U-T-E-X. If you want to Google that at home um, as you're watching this or afterwards, um, again, there's a lot of really other cool products out there. Um, I'm just covering what I can do quickly and uh, fastly here. But Gutex has a good reputation um, in terms of you know its sustain overall sustainability. Yeah, and I think you're you have a great point there. There's so many great new products on the market and so many changes coming like we talked about with global warming potential yeah I mean, the our, our friends in the blue board our friends on the pink board they're all working to make more and more sustainable materials right so that is correct sir there we go so on the performance this wall is going to have virtually the same performance as we saw with the thermal break shear wall um it it could alter a little bit be a um a little better or a little worse, depending on what types of products you use to integrate windows into, through your siding, right? Right. Um, an insulated thermal box probably better than a wood window box. Right. Um, so there are considerations, but performance is going to be very similar. Uh, yes, uh, BS and beer is um, uh, someone brought up my fine home building. It's every Thursday afternoon. Um, if you haven't done uh, BS and beer, that's for building science and beer, um, but it's for both kinds of BS and beer. Uh, that's another really fun one. I, I tend to pop in at least once a month to the BS and beer show as well. So next we're gonna talk about um, two by four double stud walls. Now, I'm lucky enough to live and work primarily in climate zones four, five, and six. And in climate zones four and five, this we see this, you ha we have seen this used quite a bit in some of our you know, really high performing homes, the ones that are approaching passive house and net zero, this has been a pretty good system. So we actually get some benefit from having continuous insulation. It's just not on the exterior. Um, it's between the two sets of walls, um, right? Now there are some draft stop that you, you're going to have to put in. So you'll have a little bit of thermal bridging, but this is a really nice, really nice wall approach, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got a lot of different opportunities, depending on how wide you want to make your sill plate, um, how thick you can make your walls. We also like this because you can choose to have one, uh, either one or both walls be advanced framed if you want. Um, but I've seen um, several where they do advanced framing on the exterior, standard framing on the interior, um, and then they shift how they do their um, sheathing. Instead of uh, running the sheathing horizontal, they run it vertical. And that just gives it a little bit more stability and, and less warping um, when they do that. If you choose to put your uh, advanced framing on the interior, you can just simply go with 5 8 inch drywall instead of half inch. And that will also help reduce any of the kind of wavy gravy complaints um, mm -hmm. that we used to get from that. Um, some people actually really enjoy having really deep window sills as well. And we've heard sales agents say, I can actually sell that as an additional benefit because it's either an additional shelf for the home, it's a place you can sit and read a book. 
um, or, you know, my cat would really enjoy barking at the birds um, when he sits in the window. So, you know, people actually look at that as an additional benefit. Yeah. Dan, with the cost of lumber today, are you seeing more people go with advanced framing, exterior, advanced framing, interior to try to put less wood into that wall structure? Uh, we're seeing a lot of people ask questions about it. And I'm going to give a couple of options a little later here um, that are potential other things besides just advanced framing. But yeah, yeah I, there was a report out yesterday from um, one of the directors at Warehouser where he does not see the, pr the, the current price of lumber being the new normal. But he also admits it'll probably never go back down to the cost it was 15 months ago. Right. Um, and, and having Warehouser kind of publicly say that yeah. tells you what kind of what you need to know. We, we are going to need to think about um, taking wood out of our homes. Right. So, you know, one of the challenges here is you may be giving up floor space, right? Thicker walls, you, have, you know, you can only can make it your footprint a little bit more on the outside or a little bit more on the inside. But a lot of our builders are already maximizing their footprint on the land. Um, and so it could be giving up interior floor space. Yeah. That's but sandable, it's yeah. square footage, right? Yeah, but yeah. You, this is a, a wall strategy where you could get up to 40% reduced UA, um, right? If you combine this with good windows. So it's a trade-off. The incremental cost, believe it or not, well, <laughs> this incremental cost from 16 months ago um, was about $2 a square foot and cost of scale maybe down to somewhere around 79, 80 cents a square foot. Yeah. I guess you could just take all of my wood costs and multiply them by 300 or, you know, three, yeah. 300% and get a more accurate yeah, um, price yeah. for the wood. And I think Dan, we just had a question come in around that, but relative scale of the prices, Dan, quote, yes. is probably accurate. The relative cost, just go ahead and multiply by 300%. Yeah, uh, again, the, the challenge is our wall costs, we're assuming insulation, you know, in cavity plus um, continuous, plus changes to the integration of windows plus the lumber. So you don't necessarily multiply the whole thing by 300%, uh, maybe multiply the whole thing by 240% or something. Sure. But you're right, on a, on a more relative scale, it, they're still relative. And I'm glad people brought this question up. Um, I have not yet gone in and actually done all the math with current lumber prices. Um, I, I follow the shoes lumber report. If anybody, follow, boy, if you ever wanna nerd out on the cost of lumber, the shoes lumber report is amazing. One of our local, um, lumber distributors up here. The guy just has a head for data and he not only showcases what the costs are now, but he puts them in a historical context and then projects what he thinks they're going to be in the next three months. So it's a really great opportunity if you're really concerned about this to kind of start looking at this. And if, if looking at prices continuing to level or go up, don't convince you to think about advanced framing, I don't know what would. Um, we do like this for its, its huge ability to re, uh, almost eliminate thermal bridging, um, but this is where, you know, in cold climates, that potential moisture issue becomes a, a really pretty good sized deal, right? Because if warm moisture um, can migrate through a wall, let's assume you do an amazing job of air sealing, but, you know, there's still some vapor transmission that can come through drywall. Um, and it goes all the way through your really thick, warm wall, and it hits a really cold piece of OSB or plywood on the exterior, um, you're going to be at the dew point sometimes, and you're going to hit a condensing surface of interest, um, a CSI, as Joe Stebert calls it. And when you do that, you know, you have that potential to have moisture. Now, question is, is there enough drying potential um, so that this isn't a huge problem? And sometimes the types of materials that you select for your sheathing can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, the, one of the answers people are doing is they're putting a half inch of rigid on the exterior or they're using an insulated siding product in colder climates to just put a little bit of warmth there. Mm -hmm. um, there also is a, a lot of attention to detail when we build tight and ventilate right, kind of goes hand in hand with advanced walls. So moisture management on the interior of our homes can also be a really critical component. Right. Um, so this is kind of what these double stud walls look like in the wild, right? And you can see um, the top left is also kind of some of the woofy analysis style showing, you know, what we see where the heat um, translates through. And, um, you know, what you don't want is the, the heat to be touching all the way through anywhere. So, you know, you can look at these double stud walls. Again, 
really cold climates, um, if you're not really, really paying critical attention, um, I would say that with any of these walls that we're talking about, where you've got your OSB or plywood on the exterior, having a, pardon my French, a kick-ass drainage plane is going to be really important because not only is that great for bulk water protection, mm -hmm. it improves your drying potential in cold climates um, because you're not sandwiched as tight. You've got that ability to dry to the exterior to a degree when you get wet. So uh, that is a critical thing to think about. Um, this is what some of our staggered studs look like in the wild. Um, these are in climate zone five. Um, so again, they're how thick you make your wall um, is a big deal here. These are very commonly up here um, in climate zone five, they're two by six sill plates. Um, every once in a while we see a two by eight sill plate. I have seen one two by 10 sill plate um, with staggered um, two by sixes on it. So again, lots of different approaches to um, get this. And you know, one of the things that I, I've seen is instead of actually going with a full different dimension sill plate. Um, talk about the cost of lumber as they used, um, used lumber um, and, and cut two by twos and nailed them around the framing to kind of extend that because it's not the structural component. It's so you would pick your side, right? The inside or the outside, depending on where you put your structural load. Basically, um, so you don't have an issue. It becomes a sheetrock nailer with a- Pretty a, much. Yeah, you're just putting a sheetrock nailer on. That's exactly right. right. Then you're not paying by, for a two by six, you're paying for a two by yep. four. Yeah, nice. That's right. Yeah, yep. Right. Um, look at the thermal performance here, wow. right? So our overall U factor is much lower in this scenario, right? So you can also think of if effective R value is easier in your brain and average R value of 36.9. That's pretty killer. Yeah. Um, and we can kind of compare these against each other. Here's a double wall versus an intermediate framed wall, the standard intermediate framed wall. Um, and I want you to right, look at this row. The double wall, I'm assuming an inch and a quarter gap between the two double studs or between the two walls, the framed walls. Um, and then I went ahead and threw R12 continuous insulation in the exterior. And look at the overall U factor or the average R value. It's both great, but in order to match what you would get with the double wall, um, you would have to put uh, dent, you know, net and blow insulation in your intermediate framed wall and have some really good continuous insulation to match that U value. Yeah. So if we think again about reducing the U value, reducing thermal bridging, and protecting against moisture, these have different benefits. Um, the intermediate framing with a lot of exterior insulation probably gonna be a much better deal for moisture protection, um, at least from transmission from the interior. Um, but the double wall, if designed right with that drainage plane and the correct materials and good interior moisture management, it's gonna be really hard to beat that from a stick frame perspective. Yeah, I agree. Dan, can you go back one slide? We got a question that just came in and I was, I was noodling this too, but is that photo with the PEX tubing uh, in the cavity an exterior wall? Or is that an interior wall where we're seeing the pecs uh, there? In the oh, that's actually, that's a really great question. That is between a garage and the interior of the house. Um, okay, so, so I think the uh, either the water heater or a plumbing manifold system is on the other side of this wall. Okay. Good, and great question. Is that considered an interior wall then because the insulation is outboard or? Um, well, you know, if it's an unheated garage, it's going to be, to a buffer zone, right? So it's not truly an adiabatic wall or an interior wall, but it's also not truly an exterior wall. From a thermal perspective, an energy modeling perspective, et cetera, it's an ex exterior wall, but in a functionality mechanism, the, since the garage in most cases will never get below 35 degrees right. um, for most of the year, um, it's probably, it, it's not quite an exterior wall. So then my question would be, is the reason they put that, um water heater in the garage is to take it off of their calculations for an energy efficiency program? Uh, it's, it, it could be one of several reasons. So yeah. obviously um, one reason is just uh, people do things the way they're used to doing them, <laughs> right? Um, that, that fortunately or unfortunately, um, yeah. right? People do it the way they used to do it. Yeah. But a better reason that in this particular house, if I'm not mistaken, 
it was a heat pump water heater and they didn't want to have to go through the whole, do I duct it, do I not duct it? What do I do with the waste cool that comes off my heat pump water heater? The answer is put those in the garage. They tend yeah. to perform very well yeah. in climate zones four, five, and six in that scenario. Yeah. So you're dumping that cold air into the garage, not yep. the inside thermal envelope. Fair enough, thank you. Um, and then there was a question that came in about what's the structural consequence of double wall? Um, and this is the, the answer, of course, of any, of any engineering question is it depends. Um, typically, one of the two walls is the one that you design to be your um, structural strength wall. The other one is effectively a nailer, either for your exterior sheathing or for your interior drywall. Um, you can actually have some structural strength in both. And obviously, both will contribute to it. So that is the kind of thing you can think about, right? Um, the decision with two by six versus two by four, if you're doing a three-story house um, with a double wall, you may want one of your two rows to be two by six, for instance. Yeah, great, thanks. Yep. So some of the other benefits, this is directly out of the NIA, um, the NIA um, market reports that we talked about, was, you know, these are, um, either documented through research or field evidence, meaning we actually went out and talked to builders and trades, um, someone did at Earth, from Earth Advantage, or we looked up research um, and, and did as much research as we could on this. Um, and again, remember the incremental cost of scale, these are from a year and a half ago. So look at them in terms of, you know, uh, relative to each other, but absolutely these are not firm costs. So you know, these each have some different types of benefits and you can look at, um, at, at what these benefits are. The seismic resiliency for the thermal break shear wall, I didn't really talk about that before, but um, the Oregon State University Earthquake Lab actually did um, some research with that wall structure. And what they found is that due to the longer nails um, or screws that were used when adhering the exterior sheathing over the foam into the studs, those longer nails actually behave better in an earthquake um, than do shorter nails. In fact, when they compared it to um, OSB just nailed directly to the studs, um, they were able to shake and absolutely destroy that wall. Um, they almost couldn't get the thermal break shear wall to break um, with if you do the proper nailing pattern. So we actually know there's some additional seismic resiliency. And out in my neck of the woods, um, where we have both volcanoes and earthquakes, uh, that's actually nothing to sneeze at. And we actually have some seismic resiliency components in our codes. Um, so if you're in high wind areas, earthquake zones, um, things like that, it, it's actually potentially a really good benefit. Um, now let's look at a little bit on some moisture. So this is gonna be climate zone 4C. And what we're looking at is um, what is the moisture um, content um, in that exterior wall up against the um, exterior sheathing um, throughout over time, right? And so the two by six standard intermediate framed walls, what is the red line? And that, I apologize if you're colorblind, this is hard enough to read as it is, but if you're colorblind, I apologize, but I'll just try to uh, just say it. The, um, that is our baseline. So what we don't want is this to perform a lot worse. And what we see is for all of these walls, they tend to perform pretty well. Maybe the initial winter, the very first winter, um, there's some considerate, uh, you know, some additional moisture that gets into those exterior walls. And that's a combination of the building drying out and, and, the, and the people dialing in how they live in their buildings. But you can see over time that moisture content, and again, 20% is a, kind of a industry standard number. I know that other people will say they like 18 and percent as a better metric. Other people will say 21% if you use the right materials. We just went with 20% for this analysis. Um, these Dan, walls all perform pretty darn well. Yeah, it oh, looks great. Dan, can you just run through the acronyms for people that may have joined yep. a little bit later of the yep. TBS? And, yeah, so thanks. TBS is the thermal break shear wall or the Martha wall or the extended plate and beam wall or a zip wall system, if you will, where that, uh, again, the continuous rigid insulation is between the studs and the exterior sheathing. 
And so we looked at it both with and without a rain screen. Um, exterior CI means exterior continuous insulation that's on the exterior of the sheeting. Um, DSW is double stud wall, and you can see it with and without a rain screen. Um, now, nobody is that surprised that these walls perform pretty well in Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. um, right? We, we already joke that we're Narnia up here, um, <laughs> but you know we don't have the extreme. Now it's getting more extreme year by year, but hasn't been that extreme. So what if it's a slightly colder climate? So what if we got to Spokane, Washington on the border of Idaho? This is squarely in climate zone five. And we're looking at this again. And you know, the, actually in a surprise to us, a standard two by six wall with no continuous insulation actually performs pretty well even in Spokane. Um, so how do these others compare to it? Well, the thermal break shear wall without a rain screen and the exterior continuous insulation, um, actually, you know, the first year were not performing that great, that very first winter. Um, they did exceed, but not by an incredibly long amount. And again, making sure you've got enough drying potential is gonna be critical here. The thermal break shear wall with a rain screen performed a lot better than the thermal break shear wall without. Um, it turns out that the, it, with the double stud wall, rain screen or no, performed about the same that first year and actually performed about the same over time with the version with the rain screen performing a little bit better. Um, so again, there's a lot of this type of analysis in these reports. So if you really wanna kind of dig in and, and really unearth you know, what's in there, it's there. Yeah. And Dan, just for the audience again, the the y-axis of this chart is water. Um, uh, it's it's per, it's moisture content in the in the sheet uh, exterior sheathing. So if you've ever used a moisture meter, right, the two pin yep. style where you jam it in the wood and hit the button, um, that it starts getting red right uh, right before twenty percent on it. So that's kind of that threshold um, number we're using twenty percent moisture content in the exterior sheet. Mm -hmm. Now, walls are well and good, but walls don't live by themselves, right? Um, there's these other things that come in here, and I'm not the one saying this. Sam Rashkin used these words. It's the windows, stupid. Mm -hmm. um, and so don't worry that there, there's a live link at the bottom here. Sorry, it's hard to see right now, but basically what Sam was saying here is that um, even if we just looked at a house with 15% window to floor area ratio, which is not a huge amount. We have a lot of houses in, in Seattle that are closer to 20, 22%. Um, windows represent a pretty big thermal hole that disproportionately upsets all the good work that you might do on your wall assemblies. So if we assume, let's say something close to an R3.3 wall or a U value of 0.30, um, and it's representing 15% of the wall area, we can invest substantial cost to make the wall cavity insulation better. Um, and, and let's say we go from R18 all the way to R39. Um, or, uh, yeah, right? So we can put a lot in there, but the, the thing is we're going to get only a marginal better. Um, so if we went from R18 on average to R39 in the wall, but had these you know, code windows, mm -hmm. um, our overall wall um, only goes from R11 to R15 on average R value with that 15%. But now if we took the same thing we put in, we call um, R5 windows or R10 windows. In this case, you put in R10 windows. That R18 insulated wall, um, you know, all of a sudden looks more like a, a you know, and, and we went from um, R8 and we jacked up the insulation again. We go up to from an R16 to an R17 in our wall. So it's pretty nice. The windows do matter quite a bit. Um, a different way to say it is, you know, look at um, what a 0 0.20 window is with an R60 wall um, is an R23. And look if we had a 0 0.30 wall, um, we'd never get there. You could have an R18 wall with a 0 0.20 window and it's like an R39 wall with a 0 0.30 window, right? Um, that R13 versus R15. So windows do matter and they matter quite a bit. Right. Um, so one way to address this is, I don't know if folks have heard about thin glass triple pane windows or thin trips as are sometimes uh, referred to. Th what's great about these is they give you the performance very similar to other triple pane windows. 
but they're the same thickness and approximately the same weight as double pane windows. And that same thickness of the glass portion is important because that means it fits within the standard casing of double pane windows. So your installation procedure, <clears throat> for it's about a 10% weight increase. The installation, you don't need more people unless you're getting to the really, really big windows to tip them and tilt them in. Um, you don't need to change any of your dimensions and some of the costs can come down. They're also available in standard double hung and slider windows where some of the other brands of triple pane have a lot of awning and casement windows, which not everyone likes that look and feel. So this brings really triple pane windows to a mainstream potential with these thin triples. Um, and at NIA, um, NIA is working with others to do some research to try to convince Plygem, Alpen, and Anderson to open more branches um, of central distribution for thin triple pane windows so that they can be more readily available. And right now we're looking hard at the Northwest and we're looking in Illinois, and we already did a pilot in California of these. Um, there's also a federal program called PAWS um, from the DOE that is um, running in parallel and NIA is contributing to, which is looking to overall increase the availability of these types of windows for everyone. So this is a pretty cool um, thing to, to take a look at. And I'll share a little bit <clears throat> later um, in my links, there's a link to um, kind of a market study on, on the, the benefits of these. So I'm just gonna go through these really quick on what, what I kind of think are some of the best, good and best walls for different strategies. So in, in different climate zones. So for climate zone four, you know, doing that intermediate framing um, and having maybe just a little bit of continuous insulation with grade one blown, making sure you do good air sealing and having an R21 energy heel at the edge of your roof to wall intersection is a pretty good wall for climate zone four and should be able to meet all of your code requirements. If you want the best wall out there in climate zone four, again, this staggered stud framing with blown insulation paying attention to tight construction, paying attention to moisture control in your building and using an energy or raised heel truss is really a, a very hard to beat wall for um, climate zone four. Um, panelized construction, by the way, is another option here. Um, panelized construction, I think that may be a, a pretty big future um, for what we're gonna see. And panelized walls can be built, you know, I've seen crazy stuff like 19.2 inches on center framing and panelized walls. And if you think that that's weird, next time you got take your tape measure out, take a oh, look. There's a there. diamond right there at 19.2 inches. It's on that's there. if you yeah if you divide uh, um, eight feet, your typical uh, length of a piece of plywood um, or OSB, uh, divide it by five, and the answer is 19.2. So it's a version of you know, moderate advanced framing. Um, so what about climate zones five and up? So a good wall is a double wall or staggered stud with some rigid foam or rock wool or insulated siding, um, radiant barriers where they're necessary, and then medium density wall cavity insulation. The best wall out there is to do something like use advanced framing. Uh, believe it or not, you can use TGI, the, what is um, the... Um, what are sometimes referred as eye joists. Yeah. Um, you can use those actually as vertical framing members. Um, you have to purchase them in the right um, length and width um, and you gotta get them structurally approved by a local engineer, but they can work. There's also a new product called the T-Stud, which I'll show you in a minute as well. Um, any of those with continuous insulation of at least R7 um, plus tight construction and always think about a drainage plane in cold climates. That's your best wall um, for those scenarios. And if you want to know more, um, you can also just look up, you know, Google uh, Perfect Wall Building Science Corporation. Um, and they've got variations of this um, with a lot of great details on how to build that. Here's that T-stud I talked about. Um, it's a little bit more expensive and maybe is not everyone's first thing to look at right now. But again, with the price of lumber, all of the sudden T-studs are becoming more cost competitive. Um, and you can get them what they call the bare naked style where you insulate the way you want, or you can get them already insulated with R19. But as you can see, they've got a thermal break built right in the middle of them. So T-Stud Wall, I think that that's gonna be, and actually they've been a sponsor or they, they were at, um, the last time Eva was live, 
Yeah. Um, I know that they were there um, and I spent a lot of time at their little booth. Yeah. Um, really cool. Yeah. Great group of folks. Great company. Yeah. So overall, you know, walls with exterior insulation will require longer nails and washers when foam is outboard and you have to frame out windows and doors. And, and we can't ignore that these are real considerations. In our cooler or colder climates, keeping that exterior sheathing dry or at least capable of drying is critical to the building's durability. Um, and then advanced framing will require looking at hangers and integrating roof, you know, truss tie downs. And again, you may necessitate five eighths inch drywall um, and slightly different um, strategies for installing your exterior sheathing to prevent the wavy gravy, especially on long walls. Yeah. Um, we're putting out um, what we call technical guides for several of these wall types on Better Built Northwest. We already have the thermal break shear wall guide available and that link is live. Um, I'm working on the continuous insulation and the double wall one right now. So we hope to have those out this summer. And then we've got a lot of different links here. So um, an entire training um, on advanced framing that a builder friend of ours, we, we had build for us. Um, some other trainings on advanced thermal wall enclosures, um, some PDFs and posters on um, how to do thermal enclosures really well and, and how to combine air tightness in with your beneficial insulation. And then I, I did mention this market transformation strategy for affordable R5 windows, that thin triple pane window report, that's also available. So all of those are live and available. Dan, just back to the R5 windows, aren't we mm -hmm. seeing on the zero energy ready home program right now that one of the options they'll ask you about is going to R5 windows? It certainly is. And that's been a, a push from the DOE for quite some time. Yeah. This and is that, that ability to maybe see them now come down and become cost competitive, yes, that's not right. just in the cost of the materials, but right. in the installation cost as well. Totally agree. So I, I think that directionally code wise, you'll see R5 windows on all of our radar screens more and yep. more. And uh, the, um, what, what was the, what did you call them? The try? Uh, the, I, the, I call them skinny triples, thin trips, thin or tri thin trip. Yeah. Um, but where I've been told by my clients for consistency sake, let's just use thin triple pane windows okay. so that we don't confuse the market. Yeah. Um, but yes, there, there's a lot out here. Yeah, great new product. Great. Well, uh, if you have, um, I did see George asked a question about what type of siding was assumed in the modeling. Yeah. Um, and George, I believe that it was um, cementitious siding. Um, you know, I'm not going to throw the brand name out there, but I believe that that was the siding type that was assumed. I would have to double check, but I believe that's that's the site that was assumed, uh, the type that was assumed. I think we can say hardy, right? Yeah, hard, hardy <laughs> plank siding or equivalent, right? Um, yeah, equivalent, sure. So I believe that that's in mostly because, again, for no other reason that this research was done in the Northwest, and that is the most common siding type for yeah. our standard track homes. Um, yeah. Now, as we get into more and more efficient homes, we got a lot of cool whiz bang stuff, and we are seeing some builders really showing some curiosity in insulated siding products, mm -hmm. where you get some of that continuous insulation built into the siding products themselves. And we've seen everything from cork to fiber products, um, there's all kinds of cool whiz bang new stuff coming mm -hmm. online for, um, you know, the, where you're kind of combining the role of weather resistive barrier insulation and siding all in one. Um, yeah. And there's really a lot coming out um, and a, a lot available, but that's what we have for today. I, we are a little bit over time, so yeah. I, I really want to thank everyone, but yeah. this is my contact information. If people would like to connect with me and um, there is a question about the recording of this presentation. Um, so folks can, uh, I'll let uh, Nancy and Aaron answer, you know, how they can get a hold of this content later. But yeah, um, we will likely post in the Northwest on our Better Built Northwest at some point in time uh, recordings good. of these as well. Yeah. So again, thank you to our partners at Better Built Northwest and Earth Advantage. And Dan, you're always such a fantastic, engaging speaker. This will be posted up relatively soon. You know, we've got to get the download. We'll post it up to the EBA Academy at eba.org. We will post it to the EBA and Team Zero YouTube pages as well. And then we'll send a copy over to our great friends at Better Built Northwest. They will also post this on their page and on their YouTube page. 
So we'll get really good accessibility for everybody to uh, share and collaborate and learn on this great knowledge. Dan, as always, awesome. thank you so much. You bet. And I look forward to hopefully seeing many of you at the EBA um, Summit conference um, a little bit later this year. Where yes. We'll be presenting on a, a variation on this topic. So yeah, September 14th through 16th, Denver. Uh, Denver is wide open right now from um, being able to have people together. So we, you know, it's been a long time and we look forward to seeing many of you in person there. And uh, Dan, I'll look forward to seeing you out there as well. Sounds good, everyone. And again, thank you so much for spending some of your time with us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.